Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, it's Pete. In this video, we're gonna be talking about why the markets won't crash until 2026. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Kathy Woods, who is in charge of the ARK Invest ETF. She is very, very popular as an investment manager. What I wanna do is have a look at some of her rationale behind that statement, see if it stacks up, see if there are lessons that we can learn as retail investors to help us on our journey in this climate right now where we're investing in, it seems, all-time high asset prices. And as always, I'm going to approach this with a level head. You don't need me adding more fuel to the flames. And I'm going to argue both sides of the, of the coin here because God knows there are contrary views against what she's basically saying and what I'm going to show you her saying at the SORT conference about a week and a half ago. Um, as always, if you do get value from this video, make sure that you leave a comment below, share, smash that like button because it will really help me out with the YouTube algorithm. And if you want more content like this, make sure you subscribe as well. Let's get going. So stock market as at an all time high. You've got crypto doing bits. I mean, as I record this right now, Bitcoin is at $61,000 a coin. And against this backdrop, you have notable voices in the finance space warning that we are approaching a really precarious place and we're approaching a really severe market crash. You've got the likes of Robert Kawasaki who wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad saying that this is going to be the biggest crash in history. You also have the likes of Michael Burry, the guy who predicted the financial crash back in 2007 and 2008 against all of the odds saying that we're in a very precarious place right now and the markets are at all time highs and it is ripe for a market correction and a severe one at that. And the reality is that whenever you look at investments or even anything, you're always gonna have opinions that are of the opposing view. And as a retail investor, how do you position yourself? How do you decide which side of the fence you sit on based on all of the news and all of the noise that you're hearing at this moment in time. Well, you take into consideration some of the arguments, you internalize them and you decide which one of them kind of ascribed to the way you see the world. But the unfortunate reality is that somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong. So this is what Kathy Wood said a couple of weeks ago at the SORT conference when she was asked about the stock market in general and retail investors. What do you think the role of millennials and the next generation will be, and I, I ask this because I've seen you make comments about demographics, mm -hmm. both in terms of the role that millennials play in terms of the actual economy, but also the role that they may play in the markets themselves. Because yes. a lot of people look at what's happened over the last 18 months in this new generation that's now in retail, often in your fund, on Robinhood, on Reddit, mm -hmm. and think something has changed. Some people think it's tulips, other people think it's forever. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I we just learned from uh, J Jolene Caruso that millennials are 70 million strong in our economy and now bigger than the baby boomers uh, as a, a, a dem demographic. And um, I'm going to hearken back to Stan Salvigson. Um, most of you won't remember who he was. Uh, uh, he made one very important call in the uh, early 80s. He said, Baby boomers are going to be the reason that the equity market goes up for the next 20 years. It was a brilliant call. He's no longer with us. I, we're in the echo now. And I do believe that both crypto and uh, the equity markets are going to be powered by millennials. In fact, um, Tom Lee at Tom Lee, yep. yeah, he, he has done the arithmetic the way that Stan did. And I think he says this bull market will not end at least until 2026, and maybe not until 2038 38. when the yep. number of millennials peaks out there. So what she said here is essentially that she believes that the stock market and the crypto market, which are two separate markets, by the way, are going to be powered by millennials. And when I initially heard this, I thought, okay, it kind of makes sense, but I wanted to delve a little bit deeper into how realistic actually is that? Now, she did mention that she thinks that the market, because of this, won't crash until 2026, and it could actually go on a, con a continued growth projection until 2038, when the population of millennials reaches its peak. 
And if you look at the retail investor movement over the last 12, 18, 24 months, and I'm speaking specifically about the sagas that you will know, GameStop, AMC, retail investors mobilizing, being involved in the markets, and actually causing problems for the traditional investment houses, fund managers, hedge fund managers, right? It was evident to see that retail investors have power. So what I thought I'd do is have a look at maybe some of the popular apps that they're using these days in the States. Robinhood is probably one of the, the popular ones that is out there. Um, they obviously got a lot of stick because of their tactics during the GameStop and AMC saga. But let's have a look at how many users they actually have. At the moment in 2021, they have 22 and a half million users. In 2020, that number was only 13 million. In 2019, it was only 10 million. So that's a huge amount of growth. And that shows that there are more people who are looking to take charge of their financial futures and invest in the market using services like that. Now, Robinhood is clearly in the United States. We're here in the UK. So let's look at some domestic companies that you will know. So let's have a look at the likes of eToro. They now have 20 million users as of this year majority of which I would argue will subscribe themselves to being millennials. But let's also have a look at Trading212. So Trading212 haven't opened accounts in the UK here since January. And this little stat, this little graphic right here was produced, I think around about January, February, it was put out by um, Trading212. And it kind of told the story of the growth that they that they'd had in the preceding 12 months. And as you can see here, they went from 400,000 clients to 1.4 million clients in just 12 months. And they had daily active users at 600,000 a day, up from 28,000. Again, pure evidence that retail investors are taking charge and are having a real influence on the market. But these numbers alone just don't tell the story. I then did some little bit of a further dig and actually had a look at, okay, what is the actual financial strength that retail investors can actually can bring to bear. And I found this article from September this year, and it says here, retail traders road to rescue bought $1.9 billion worth of stocks. Now, $1.9 billion is a lot of money. Many will argue maybe small fry when you compare them to hedge fund managers and investment houses, the likes of BlackRock, so on and so forth. But from a retail point of view, this is still a lot of money that was not in the market in the way that it is right now, active, playing its part, helping prop up stocks like GameStop and AMC, having a real influence in this space. It's the reason why so many investment houses have spent money on trying to understand the mind of the retail investor. So part of our argument actually does have merit. And it is possible that the millennials are going to be able to spurn further growth in the market so the markets won't crash until 2026. That is quite feasible. However, it doesn't negate some of the real fundamental issues that are being faced by the market and economies across the world altogether. And that is, you know, inflation, high asset prices, so on and so forth. And on the counter argument to inflation, I think it's really important to acknowledge what inflation is and why we are in a place of, it would say, inflation at the moment. And people are talking about hyperinflation. It is a byproduct of COVID and it is a byproduct of bottlenecks in the supply chain. This instance of inflation is regarded to be transitory. Whether that turns out to be true or not will be a case for us to review in three to six months time to see if it does subside as the world gets back to normal. With that being the case, central banks across the world are debating whether they should increase interest rates or not. It seems as though the Bank of England here in the UK would likely be the first uh, central bank to move by increasing interest rates at the moment. We're going to find that out on the 4th of November, which is only a matter of weeks away. The other reason why you may argue that the stock market won't crash until 2026 is because if you just take a look at the S&P 500 and the top 10 holdings in the S&P 500, every single one of those companies are performing extremely well. The likes of Amazon, Tesla, Google, Facebook, these companies have seen revenue growths 
uh, record revenues over the last 18 months and actually benefited from the COVID um, crisis that we that we're just coming out of now. So there are reasons to be buoyant. But the big question is, does all of this negate the argument that Michael Burry and everyone else has put in across around the fact that asset prices are high? Asset prices are extremely high in comparison to where we have been historically. But I think it's really important to bear in mind that new highs are new highs and every new high is going to be a new high that has never been seen before. I think ultimately, if you are an investor, investing for the long term, and you've heard me say this already on the channel before, if you are investing for the long term, you needn't worry about a market crash because if you're investing for 10 to 15 years, you have enough time to see out the cycle. If you are investing for the short to medium term, then if you're worried about losing money and you're nervous, then it kind of tells that you should probably have a look at rebalancing your portfolio, at least coming to reassess how risky your portfolio is in terms of its allocation to equities and maybe looking for some safer assets like bonds where you're going to get you know, pretty poor bond yields at the moment, but will offer you slightly more security. I think at the heart of this conversation, you have to think about what your goals are and what you need your investment to deliver for you moving forward. If you are in need of your income in the near to short term or midterm future, so five years, within five years, maybe six, even seven years, then you should be looking at rebalancing your portfolio and, and seeing if you are comfortable with the level of risk that you're taking. If you want, then that answers the question for you. But guys, I hope that you found that useful. Let us know what you think in the comments. Do you think that millennials have the purchasing power and the ability to keep this market buoyant until 2026, possibly until 2038? It's a bold claim, but it's Kathy's conviction. That's what she thinks. It'll be interesting to see how much of that is actually reflected in her arc investments, although with her ARK investments, she really has a five-year view more than anything else, and she's investing in future technology more than anything. But it'll be interested to hear your views.